We got our database, eh, it's been two and a half years ago, I think, is our current database. And there's a little story that goes along with this. Um, this database was written for another nonprofit in town, Portland Fellowship, and um, Les Fennison, we give him all kinds of names, but that's his real name. Les is the designer of this template. Uh, he designed it for Portland Fellowship, and we looked at it and said, well, that's pretty cool, but we have so many little ins and outs that we need to change on this database because we're not just a, a standard type of a nonprofit. We're not, we're not, we don't have um, a big donor base that we're working with. We have participants, and we need to track all of this information on our participants. And uh, as Dave said, document, document, document. You know, we write everything down. I mean, ad nauseum, we really do. And, the, and we needed something to track all of this information. So um, we wrote a grant and we got some money to revise the template. Les said, you have access to my template. I will revise it to fit your needs and then you pay me for that time, and then you can. I will charge you a monthly fee to maintain that database. That monthly fee is based on the number of records in our database. Our records are massive. Um, has to do with you and your wife, or two records, you know, that kind of thing. Um, fortunately, we're not we're not counting our the people that have left the program. They're discontinued. But uh, the good news is, and the reason why we're going into this a little bit more with you today, is that uh, you too can be one of Les's best friends if you want. I tell you, it comes at a cost. He's a little bit frustrating too, <laughs> and I'm sure he feels the same way about us. But I talked to him yesterday and said, you know, Les, we're going to talk about you at, at this. And so y when I send people your way, you have to be nice to them. <laughs> and he, he laughed. I have a little picture of him. On my computer, he has little uh, little devil's things, you know, and, and and a little mustache. And I showed it to him when he came in last time. So he was perfectly good with that, and he laughed. But um, database stuff is makes you crazy anyway, right? It just does. So uh, the the point is that you can access less, and then Kim's going to talk a little bit more about how that all works, uh, and then. <coughs> If you wanted to do everything exactly like BCS does, you wouldn't have to change anything on the database. But if you if you did something different, then you would pay him to revise it for you. All right, are you ready? Hi. I met you briefly on yesterday on Friday. Um, I'm Kim Ikihara, and I've been with BCS since 2006, and. When we began, when I began working there, I started as a referral person, and we worked off an access database, which um, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, we're talking about a little bit of a different menu uh, than we had the other night in terms of what we're going to display for you today. Um, we were with Microsoft before, uh, which offered us no online access. I'm going to start here with organizing your records and building a database. So Microsoft Office doesn't allow you to, to interact um, on with your database off-site. So we were limited in that capacity. We moved from access to an online database in 2010. And we, like Suzanne mentioned before, we had to enlist the um, professionalism of an IT guy. We have several IT guys that help us uh, maintain it, but we needed Les Benson to help us build it. Um, so we left Microsoft Access and we went to a web-based database. Um, so they, first of all, are no, the the drawbacks to access was not being able to use it. And one of the wonderful things about having a web-based 
database is that when I go home, if there's something I need to do, something I need to update on a participant record or any other record, I can take care of it from my house. One good example of using it was two years ago when I had um, to serve on a jury and we were right in the middle of our count to value. And I took a stack of papers that I had to input and I stayed up in my hotel room just inputting data. So it was really nice uh, to be able to take care of that in a timely manner. Um, and then we moved and we left Microsoft Access and we went online. Um, we did a Google search of options for online databases, and the number I found was 3,110,000,000 results. So your capacity to find someone to work with is only limited by your time spent on line looking. Um, there are free online database services that you can use. But again, you get what you pay for, so you might want to not consider that. Um, Fee-based online database services are the one is what we're using now. And before we worked with Less, I did a webinar with Blackbaud. Blackbaud is an option. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them, but they are very, very expensive. Um, they're they serve dozens or, or thousands of uh, nonprofit agencies um, who are all fighting for the same donor dollars. But I think it was mentioned earlier, too, that we didn't start out donor-based. We are uh, run, our um, facility is uh, dues-oriented. Our families pay a service fee. Um, so that was, um, it didn't really fit uh, what we were about at the time. Um, Results Plus is another one that I Actually, I've gone to two seminars on theirs, and they're, again, donor-based, and I have the packet right here with information on fundraising that their emphasis is more on fundraising, and again, we've had three fundraiser breakfasts, so we're not exactly um, keeping and tracking and moving in that direction. Um, we currently are with Delta Technical Services, which is our Ministry Connections URL, so... Les is part of this organization. Actually, it's his organization, and he runs it. And it's local, which we really like about it, um, which, again, allows us to use it off-site. Jane can take it home and do things with it. We can get access to all of our participants, our donors, our agencies, everyone that we have entered on there through um, the Internet. Ministry Connections is the... Um, what we use in terms of the database. And I wanted to just briefly go through each of the, um, a few of them, not each of them, because you can drill down. It's unlimited, basically, what you can do with your database if you set it up yourself. So I want to go first to an overview of the database. And these are just a few of the print snips that I applied. There's more, many more than this. And we want to look first over here at the um, home page. So this little home page, there's a little word up there that says home. I'm going to go straight across the top of this bar and, uh, or this ribbon. If you're an access person, it's kind of like a ribbon for the database um, and not access, Excel. So we're going to look at the home page and it says right there who's on. So you can see that it's me. Each of us have our own um, portal to enter, our, ad our admin portal. Um, one of the things that you want to look at on this page are all the, at a glance, you can see everything that's happening on your database, which is really um, wonderful. You have the um, things needing attention, and you can see every night when I go home, I look at this to-do list, and it's nothing to do. So that's the way I like to leave the office every night. And if there's something to do, it's generally something I have to do, which is I have to deposit things. Because under that one, it says undeposited items. So um, I'm going to show, I'm going to drill into that a little bit later. So, so this, the next one is general statistics. And this reveals all the things about BCS um, at a glance in terms of statistics. And we have... Um, 
you can look at those yourself. I think you have this paper. It's the third tab in your binder if you haven't already found that. I'm sorry I didn't mention that earlier. Recent emails. This is really nice because lately we've been sending out volumes and volumes of emails. We send them out uh, alerts announcing different things that are going to happen at the program, when they're going to happen. We uh, classes, and I often send out email alerts requesting drivers, requesting volunteers to come forward and um, make pickups for us. And so once I send it out, I go right over to that little button there, and I push that little envelope, and I can open it and go directly to that person's email account and find out, did they get it? Or did I say something wrong? It's really a nice accountability thing. I just love it. And then the login history. This right here explains to you, or, or Suzanne, or anybody that wants to see, well, did Kim come in today? Well, it says, yes, she did. She's right there. And what time I came in, and what day. So it's a really nice um, information at a glance. We're going to move across to members. And uh, under the members page, there, under the ribbon members, you can access, you can search, you can do an advanced search, you can do a pending activation and an add new member. I just want to tell you up front that we don't even use all of the things that are available to us on this database because we haven't opened up portals. You have the option of allowing your participants or people that are on record here to access information that you establish or, or limit as well. And when, you, when I go to the next screen, you'll get to see that portal and it's not open currently to our families to view their own records. But it is an option that you can ask for if you're planning on setting up your own online database. And we'll go on to the next one. And this is a drill in. So we went from members to member search and we found the birches. And this is the Birch record. And there's a picture of Mr. Birch. Oop. I didn't mean to do that. Let me go back. Oop. Oop. How did that happen? OK, so there's Barry. And this first, this first page is the member info, info tab. And it just clearly, all it's self-explanatory in terms of the record type. Uh, Barry's listed as a volunteer. We also have participants, we have um, agencies, we have other, and there's categories that you can establish on your own there. Um, on the bottom, I want to draw your attention to the information. Those little, all these little buckets on the bottom here, those are all custom fields that we ask Les to put in. And they are information that allows us to um, record their time, their volunteer time. Rich is right there. We can um, record their payments. Each button, if you push any of these buttons, it drills down into another phase of this particular record. So you can see that we can um, record our yearly count the value. So once a year, we do what we call count the value. I'm sure you've heard of that already, in which uh, families go ahead and um, Anyway, all of that is covered uh, on each of these buttons. Is there an ugly scale on it? <laughs> <laughs> well, the dog is really cute. <laughs> little Belle, their little puppy dog. <laughs> uh, the next one is drilling down into what we did was we went to participation, participant information. And this is on that first tab, which is right there. It's an info tab. It's just blown up, drilled into. And in this, we record all their information about their um, finances. We can, oop, we can leave messages right here. And that is going to become evident later on when I show you the, um, the check-in screen uh, for alerts to each participant as they check in. And this one is another drill down into the same record of uh, the birches. And um, it's constantly reminding you that you're in that screen by their name right here. It's a second tab over. This is a really nice area, and I'm going to show you this in detail in a minute. It's a custom fields. All of these fields I entered myself. So I were able to track a lot better to narrow your search or to give specific information on events that it, you're 
people may have attended. We have on there the NBC Nightly News. So if any of these are checked, if they attended a, an, an event, or if they have a gluten-free allergy, we track our families uh, real specific. You can get real specific in terms of how you want them to be remembered. This particular field is really nice, too. This is uh, going across the top ribbon. We went, jumped over to deposits. And you'll see on this one that the deposits. Um, these, this actually comes uh, as a result of looking at this drop-down menu right here. Um, if you go into deposits, you can either get direct deposits that we get from the families, card settlements, which has to do with credit cards that we don't accept at this time. And then for families who don't have email, we can print receipts for them. Um, moving on to across the ribbon at the top again, you'll hit the report and go down to the reports tab. And um, this is an example of the year-to-date product log. We have this information is huge. We can generate all the reports, and I didn't make this on your Prezi, but this is just a drop-down menu of some of the things that we've done. This is really nice. I wanted to point out a really nice feature that we like, or that I particularly like, and it's that you can take this. It says right there that you can download this to export a file. So if you're comfortable with Excel, you just click that button, and this will give you all the information about these agencies. And it's right now, it's just showing you quantity, units, product type. But if you drill down into an Excel spreadsheet, it will give you across the board every category related that has, um, is related to that agency. And then you can present a, a really nice report. And not all of them have it. So in also under reports, across the tabs again, so we're still in the same category, and we're going across the top, uh, or the information available under the reports. We've moved to letters. And we can make these letters, or they can be templates that are available uh, only by your database designer to make for you. Um, he has a lot of clients, and so he likes to make things that uh, can, uh, his other clients can use as well. But these are unique to Birch Community Services. And the volunteer time reminder letters are sent out on uh, every two weeks. And they are exported. You can uh, do print preview on here after you pull out the letter. And this is not on, your, not on Prezi either, but these are the letters. And they go out to all of our families. This is what I was talking about earlier when, you were, when we were in that personal record of the birches. It's that custom fields button that's on each record. These are the custom fields that we have um, entered in and will show up. Everything is linked, so it's really nice that all this information is linked to each record. And so you can click on or add to it, and it's limit unlimited. You, even though that page looks small, you can keep going and going and going. This is a record of um, when you go to preferences on the preference tab under the income, you can, you can s establish new um, categories. So we have several income categories. And I just wanted to say that these little buttons here are, are all things that you would have to learn and get used to as you work with your database. But they're, you know, you can either delete one, you can, um, correct it with the pencil. There's all kinds of ways for you to use this. It's not completely, when you do a query on your people, um, it's only limit, it's limited in that way um, uh, because it's not, it's, on, it's online. And so you can, if you're familiar with shopping or doing things online, you're only limited to the boxes available. So you can't really manipulate it as much as access, but it's still fabulous. It's been a, uh, just a, a godsend for us, and well, I wanted to give you a copy of a letter. Now, we write these letters, and I change them monthly, 
So you go in, and this is just a payment reminder letter that gets emailed out to all the families on our program and reminds them that their dues are outstanding, if it is the case. This is the product log. Again, this, is, this one is not available to export. You'd have to ask him if you wanted to export that particular one, and I'm just thumbing through these quickly. Um, the last one, well, it's not exactly the last one, but I wanted to go over to the classes, and we set up classes, and we um, enter the participants that attend the classes, and it's a nice thing, uh, a way, this button also shows up on their homepage, to find out if they've attended. Some classes are required, some are optional. Um, the Good Sense class is a required class after they've been on the program or a year or if they return. So it's a good way to find out if uh, they've indeed attended. I wanted to give you um, a copy of this and talk about it just briefly. I know that all of you who took the tour yesterday got this, but it wasn't in your folder if you take three of these or one, one each. Pass these around. Take one and pass it on, and I'll give it to the back. This is a, 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 a picture of the, um, of the screen, and this is not typical, but we just wanted, do you want to take one and pass them down, please? Pass them around to the back, thanks. We just wanted to give you a picture of, of what um, it would look like, and this is actually not on the Prezi. So if you're looking at your um, people as they come in, this is a snippet from the check-in that you're familiar with. And you can click them off as the um, information, you know, is given out, if they've got mail, you had, all this was covered yesterday. Um, I think that I'm going to go back. In terms of the future, one of the things that excites me a lot about the database is that there's still so much room to grow. There's so many things that we haven't tapped into so many resources on our existing database. Um, it just seems like it's going to continue to give us options in terms of our donors, in terms of where we're going to go in the future. And I'm really happy uh, with the way we're allowed to use it in terms of record keeping. It makes everything very efficient and clean and tidy. Um, and having said that, do you have any questions about the database? Yes. It's very easy to do that. You can use the database to um, something that was on there um, in terms of a member search report. So we can pull up a report that says member search. We can get agencies, we can get participants, we can get whoever we want to, to receive it, and then we just click send email at the top. A window opens up, you type in what you wanted to say, and then you click send, and it goes. And it's just that fast. <laughs> it's really nice, too. You can go the long way and export it to an Excel document, save it onto a da-da-da-da. Does it also help you like, pick up names? It certainly does. Yeah, it's wonderful. You can use first name, last name, first name, and last name. You know, and we have a, we have a, f a limited field of... Uh, links that we can insert into the emails. Um, and it's limited by what we've asked Les to give us. No. Well, we, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, it goes out to me and everybody else that I've asked it to. So, my question was, who does this database? Do you put it in the back of the room? So that you do your own search? 
No, I, I, I thought maybe you were going to talk about the designer. We have, there's another man named Jeremy, or uh, Jason. They worked on it together, didn't they, build this? Uh, it was way before. Jason is the director of Portland Fellowship, mm -hmm. and Les is his best friend. So Les designed it. Mm -hmm. Jason told him what he wanted, and Les designed it. He is the designer. Yeah, so we're, we're but he has several clients. It's a my my speak my squ my sequel my SQL <laughs> SQL 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 yeah that's all I know about what that is don't <laughs> ask me what it is <laughs> yes. Sure. To, to revise the database from what was designed for Portland Fellowship was about $10,000. So we expected it was going to take a lot of time because of all the intricacies and because you can see we're, we're documenting everything. And pretty it's, much. It's half the price of Blackboard. And yeah. Kim had done had gone to the seminars mm -hmm. and theirs were more. They were starting for the quote I got was starting at about fifteen thousand. And then you still have to pay a monthly fee. We started out at our monthly fee, which I'm sure would probably be appropriate for where you guys are at, at one hundred and twenty five a month. And it's it's about two hundred now. And then Les charges sixty five dollars an hour for his time. We got a grant for that first ten thousand. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes. Did you get a parenting system too, or do you have another program that does all the parenting stuff? Uh, we use uh, QuickBooks Pro nonprofit for our basic accounting, but Kim does all the deposits and how the deposits break down and apply to each account for our participants, our agencies, <coughs> and donations. But it it. It's great because the the reports are they they're perfect to, to work with QuickBooks. I mean, they don't connect, but we don't have any problem whatsoever. Yes. Did you say that you're not accepting credit cards currently or debit cards for that fifty dollars a month service fee? And, we and do not. We don't because we want, don't want to perpetuate the use of credit cards for uh, things that aren't necessary. And we feel like people need to eat and they're going to spend $50 a month on food anyway. We don't want to encourage people to use credit cards to buy food. So and what about debit cards? Or no, <laughs> we don't take debit cards. We just don't feel like we need to take that headache. Yeah. It's an option, though, if you choose that. We, we run them as none. Yeah. yeah. So cash or checks or only cash only? Uh, cash or checks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So food is going. And what was the plan for this hour lunchtime? Are you going to do the donation now? Mm -hmm. Is there any employee food that will then be available to make the donation? <coughs> Um, let me just ask the question if do you want to continue some question and answer time on the database we're happy to do that are there people that have more questions on the database Af after you get food I should say <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what what we're gonna do because we had planned on having Marcy give just her experience kind of a testimony of her experience with Hope Station uh, today but her sister died earlier this week so we don't have that planned. We will continue back on our program at 1 o'clock, but Dave Anderson is here to answer your questions, and you can ask, pin any of us down during, during this time, take advantage. Uh, if we've touched on it already, if we haven't touched on it, 
Okay, then let's save your questions and see if it comes up a little bit later on. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the, I know one of the biggest th questions that you have is on product, and so Barry's going to talk. And he's going to share some, and then Andrew is going to come up and share some. So we'll try and, and let them talk and give them a few minutes for questions and answers. Mm -hmm. This whole section, this last half of today, is going to be about how a church works. So the uh, luncheon was courtesy of Chipotle, and uh, we pick up at several different Chipotles, and so we are highly favored to get good quality stuff. We actually get, sometimes get even lobster from Red Lobster, and uh, Olive Garden sends us incredible shrimp and chicken. I mean, we, we live in the lap of luxury. And uh, we eat like kings. <clears throat> we we would never be able to afford to eat what we eat if we, if we had to buy it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's part of the reason why I, I guess I'm not paid, you know, because I I eat my my paycheck is <laughs> is what I what I eat. Well, I mentioned earlier, and uh, in just talking with a lot of you one-on-one, -on -one, uh, how we, we had never intended to start a food distribution program. And uh, it was just like God started it. And just the whole time we felt like it's almost been like one of these things, come this way. And uh, we would try our best, and then when we didn't listen really well, we'd, we'd hit a wall or a speed bump and get back in the saddle and tweak it. But um, at the, Right from the beginning, in very unique ways, uh, Suzanne and I began to understand that uh, in totally unexpected and unsolicited uh, manner, God began to match our abilities with our responsibilities in a way that we could have never dreamed. And uh, I was just sharing uh, a few minutes ago with somebody that in a way, I kind of think it's like, it's almost like heaven. Because I, I believe when we get there, God's going to give you an assignment that, that just uh, immaculately matches your abilities with your responsibilities. And the thing is, he, he did it for us down here, you know. And we still got to mess with our own uh, sin nature and, and uh, working with people who are sometimes... Uh, not deserving and maybe uh, deceitful, but, uh, but we have a delightful job. And it all started off with that bag of bread on our front porch. So the very first donor that we had was Union Gospel Mission. They gave us a bag of bread, a couple bags of squished bread on our front porch. Now Union Gospel Mission comes to our warehouse every week and picks up product from us. They're one of the agencies that we serve, so that's come full circle too. And and God has continued to put uh, by our side people who have been able to make significant difference in what we're doing. And so Union Gospel Mission gave us that bread, and then they passed our name on to the Blanche House, which is a soup kitchen downtown Portland. And Blanche House gave our name to, because uh, they were offered something they couldn't use, they gave our name to Sunshine Division of Portland Police, which is a a food distribution agency that's been around for about a hundred years in Portland, <clears throat> and then uh, they couldn't use 3,500 pounds of Starbucks coffee that was over roasted that uh, that Northwest Medical Teams had, so they gave our name to Northwest Medical Teams, and so we put it all under a big blue tarp on the back patio of our house. And I mean, that's just the way we've gone. We, uh, I was still working my own job, so I. I never even thought about going out and soliciting donations. And besides, we had uh, pretty much our plates full just taking care of what, what was given to us what, uh, when people called. So <clears throat> we, we ended up just responding. And uh, I'll never forget 
when in 1997, after we'd been doing this for five years, when I finally became salaried and I could turn my back on my business, I closed my business doors. I thought, oh, wow, this is so cool. You, I'd been successful in sales. So I just said, turn me loose, God. I'm going to head out there and just start uh, th thumping on every door I can find and I'll fill this, this whole patio and the garage full of food. And so I, I went out, I went about it, because I had more time then. And, uh, and I would go and, and knock on somebody's door and tell them, yeah, we're <coughs> Birch Community Services, we're helping the working poor, it's really a neat thing, you know, would you like to contribute? And they'd say, oh, no, uh, we're given to the Oregon Food Bank, and we're content, they're taking good care of us. And, and I thought, hmm, that's not what I was expecting, you know. Uh, you know, I wonder what's going wrong here. So I'd go sit in the car and I'd pout a little bit and, uh, and then my phone would ring and somebody would say, uh, yeah, I got your name from uh, Northwest Medical Teams and we got this stuff, do you want it? And, and so I'd say, yes, that'd be great. And then I'd say, okay, uh, God, I, I remember who's in charge here. It's not me, it's, it's really you. And so over and over again, God has shown me that uh, he has been our provider. I wish I had some magic formula to convey to you folks about how you can start about uh, raising donations, but I really don't. Uh, I remember even when I was in retail sales, cold calling is an extremely frustrating and uh, usually fruitless venture. And so what I'm going to say is just simply... If you're seeking somebody to be on your board of directors, see if you can find a food broker or somebody that's connected to the food industry because anytime you can get somebody to open a door for you to go in and talk to somebody about donations, it's going to be a, a, make a world of difference because cold calling for food. I've done some of it, and I've been somewhat successful at it. Uh, and we do have donors now who are people that I just call. I just went to see or call them. Uh, but for the most part, um, we, we just uh, try and do the very best job we can with the responsibilities that are on our plate that day and, uh, and then just kind of wait and see what God does with that. And normally, if you treat somebody really good, a donor really good, they're, they're not going to forget it. And I have to be honest with you, uh, a lot of our donors are quite a bit more interested in floor space than they are in philanthropy. And, and they just uh, want to get it out the door. And, and a lot of times they could even care less who you are or where it's going. Uh, they just want you to get it out of there. So if you become the best one around at doing that, then they'll pass your name on. And they'll probably give you more stuff. So... I've got some, some bullets that I think I'd like to share with you. And uh, yeah, there they are. Um, I monitor the donation hotline for Birch Community Services 24-7. Uh, when, when I leave the house, I forward it, my landline, to this cell phone. And uh, a couple of calls came in yesterday while I was standing in front of you. One of them was Mission Foods. I don't know, how many pallets did we get? Uh, I think it was five. Five. So yesterday, while I was talking to you guys, uh, sharing the story about how we got started, my phone rang, and Mission Foods had five pallets of product that we went to pick up. And then I got another call, and it was Costco Tiger, and they had a, a memory foam king-size mattress that was... Uh, that they wanted to donate. So I don't know, that's a six or seven hundred dollar item. So yeah. is it a thousand? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, that just happened while I was talking to you folks. Now what would have happened if they got an answering machine? Especially if it's perishable product. And there, there are two organizations that I've, one of them I've already mentioned, which is Sunshine Division of Portland Police. And the other one that's <clears throat> only a mile or so from our warehouse, uh, they've been around, the one that's a mile from our warehouse, twice as long as we have. They're, they've been in operation, I think, for over 50 years. And last year, they did maybe a million or a million and a half pounds of product, 
And Sunshine Division of Port of Police been around 100 years, maybe did 2 million pounds worth of product. And I can't help but think that the reason, if you ever tried to call this organization that's close to us to give them something, you would have to leave a message and then they would transfer, you'd have to push one to hit this connection and press two to reach another destination. And, and then you'd hear somebody give their title, which would wrap clear around a bus, you know, warehouse administrator, professional in inventory control specialist. Or so. I mean, uh, I don't know what, <clears throat> but they, they just seem to be really caught up on giving people titles. And, uh, and then I've left messages and they've never responded. So when we've tried to give them stuff, so why do you think we did 6.1 million pounds last year and they did maybe a million and a half? And so uh, accessibility, I think, is critical. It's probably the most important tool that I can give you. And if our, our, our donors have never had to talk to an answering machine. My phone rang at 10 minutes after 6 last Sunday morning. And guess where I was? I was sound asleep, but the phone woke me up, and it was a trucker who was on the road and had some chicken that they wanted to donate, and who else could they have called at that time of the morning? So, And then I got another call just about an hour later, I think it was, from another truck driver who had some, some chicken that had been refused because the box was crushed or something. And So we got several hundred dollars worth of chicken uh, while I was asleep, basically, you know, that... So, I mean, if you can find somebody that can be that, that available, uh, that's critical. The other thing is, if you can be the best ones around at getting there quickly and getting it off the floor, uh, as I said earlier, they just want to, to free up floor space. So the promptness is, is, a, is extremely important. And so I usually say, the first thing, I almost always say this, when... Uh, Lori called from Pepsi last uh, Thursday morning, and she said she had 22 pallets of product for us. And I said, wow, Lori, that's wonderful. When do you want us there? And she said, well, tomorrow would be great. And I thought, well, uh, we're having this seminar uh, tomorrow, and it would be better for us if we could get started on it today. Would that work? And she, says, she said, I can make it work. And so they, we made two runs, because it would all fit in one truck. Uh, to Pepsi that morning. So it's extremely important that you be prompt and that you, uh, that you know what to ask them before you come. If it's, if it's a new donor and you're not familiar with the situation, you have to ask some questions, some key questions, and it's good to know what to ask. And I think that kind of comes with time too, but I had already been involved in warehouse operation before and I knew to ask, like, do you have a dock high facility there? Because it's not fun to send a dock high truck if you're going to be picking stuff off the ground and lifting it up four feet high to shove it into a truck. Find out if you have to do a pallet exchange. If they, want, they don't want their brown pallets or their chip, blue chip boards to leave the building, then you can bring them some to exchange so that you don't have to make two trips and go back. And then if, if it is, has to be hand loaded, sometimes, and if it's really heavy product, you want to make sure that you send two people instead of one to drive. So. There's a lot of uh, things that you'll learn as you grow that will help you help save you a lot of time. But when you come prepared, that really speaks volumes to the donor as well. We try and, and make it our policy, and this isn't one of the bullets, so you can write this down, because I, I just thought of it later, but we try as best we can to never say no. Many times I've heard donors complain about uh, organizations, I won't name names, but who show up and pick through stuff. And uh, there have been times when, when we have just said to a large donor that maybe they were trying to take advantage of us and just tell them, you know, we can take this and give it to the pigs, but it's not edible. Uh, you know, do you still want us to take it? And, and usually they'll come around and they'll start giving you decent product. But... Uh, Sometimes you have to work with them a little bit before they realize that they're, they're not just saving dumpster fees when they give you products. So. But try your best to never say no. Uh, it's really important that you know the benefits uh, to the donor uh, for you being there to pick up the product. So uh, tell them about 
the tax advantage. Tell them that uh, they are going to be saving a dumpster fee. And just the labor and even loading the dumpster. Uh, Albertsons across the street from our warehouse, uh, they, they used to spend a lot of money uh, in labor just putting stuff into a dumpster, which cost them a lot of money to empty. And uh, when we told them that we would take stuff that was on the code date or even slightly past, if it was still usable, they were thrilled because it just saved them a lot of money. And because we're not federally funded or members of the Oregon Food Bank, we could take things that are past code. Uh, there was a Good Samaritan Food Act that was passed during the uh, Clinton administration, and it protects donors from frivolous litigation arising out of product donated with, with good intent. Uh, I think if you just Google Good Samaritan Food Act, it'll pop up, and you can print it out and make that available to your donors. And a lot of times, people... We even have some clients that lock their dumpsters because they're afraid of the liability of uh, people taking things out of their dumpsters. So, um, I've been standing on the loading dock at large companies who are donating product alongside of other organizations' representatives. And my goodness, folks, um, there, I've met some people there that I would never send out uh, because a lot of times the first contact that a donor has with your organization is the person uh, who arrives to pick up the product. And, and if you're not putting your best foot forward, uh, it can really be damaging. And I had a, a guy who was missing teeth and, and doing this while I was talking to him on the loading dock in a customer's warehouse. And I'm just thinking, my goodness. So... Uh, a while ago, I told you that uh, the only thing we've really, really learned from other organizations was how not to do it. That was one of the things that I learned. Is that you want to take people that you can be proud of and send them out to your, peop to your uh, donors. Uh, transportation, and I needed to be more active, right? I don't know. You can't just drive past if you're not on the road. Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay, the, I have a bullet here that's not on that card because it's covered by Andrew, so that's... And then maybe the second most important thing uh, besides monitoring the phone 24-7 is gratitude. If um, we have a, a really unique uh, uh, system for our families of writing thank you notes to our donors, and we ask each family to write one or two thank you notes each month, and maybe you're going to cover this later, but, um, but anyway, it's been a tremendous tool for us, and uh, I go into warehouses, and sometimes I'll see the notes on their bulletin board out in the warehouse, maybe for their warehouse people, just, uh, that are from our families. Uh, I'll never forget the time I was at Northwest Medical Teams, and they had given us a whole bunch of shoes, and uh, some little kid drew pictures of, of mommy's new shoes. And, and, and then uh, he, he drew pictures of mommy, Mommy's old shoes, and they had holes in the toes, and, and he wrote, Mommy's new shoes, Mommy's old shoes, thank you. you know, and I mean, that is so powerful. And uh, not too long ago, I was at Costco, and uh, I walked by one of those tables that, where they're serving samples, and the gal who was serving samples is actually on our program, and she hollered at me, and she said, oh, I just got to tell you, I was in the employee's break room this morning, and I saw uh, the thank you note that you sent to Costco, uh, uh, thanking them for the product, that they, and they put it up on the bulletin board for all their employees to see. So, I mean, it can just be such a trickle down. So it ends up that the, th the guys who are on the way in the back end of the dock that are giving us the product are actually uh, f reading something that expresses gratitude, and it just makes them want to give more and treat you better. You know, so uh, you c I don't think I can overemphasize uh, that you need to express your gratitude. And sometimes we get so caught up in our process that we forget our purpose, and we we forget to uh, you know be thankful to the people who give us the product. It's just so critical, and. Uh, 
I think uh, <clears throat> I was writing in the car with Mark Childs, the president of our board, one day, and my phone rang. And whenever my phone rings and I'm with him, he says, God calling. And, and it is. And uh, so uh, I can't remember now who it was or what they gave me, but, but when I was done, I just did what I usually do and just said, wow, thank you so much. This is really going to make a difference. We really appreciate this, and we'll make sure we're there, on, or whatever I said. And he said, man, Barry, when I hung up, he said, you'd have thought they'd given you a truckload of gold, you know, and I don't remember what it was. It wasn't anything that significant, I don't think, but it's just that, that that's who I am, you know, that's what I do. And uh, so I think that's, that's just a critical thing for you to be uh, continually expressing your gratitude. <clears throat> so in, just in review of, of getting product and, re and uh, exposing yourself to to uh, potential donors. Look for somebody on your board of directors who's in the food industry who can open doors for you and connect. Talk it up at your church. Find out there's probably somebody in your church who works in a food warehouse or something and can start opening a door for you because that's so important. It's, I'd, I'm not going to say it's a complete waste of time, but I think you'll be very, very discouraged if you go out and just start banging on doors without some kind of a door opener or a, a name, at least, to go ask for. So, so not only has the referral system worked really, really well for us in growing and uh, expanding our, client, our participant base, but it has been really the key for us in uh, receiving um, uh, donations and developing relationships with donors has been the referral system. So I've talked about going out and getting it, and now Andrew's going to come and talk about. Oh, yeah. Do you do you have any questions? <laughs> yes. No, at Olive Garden, we'll get great big bags of frozen soup that will be just what they had left over in the bowl. But, but what we get from all of those places is product that's been uh, completely uh, prepared and didn't get consumed. Sometimes we'll get a, a really nice big steak from uh, Olive Garden, and maybe uh, the person that was served to uh, said it's too well done or something mm -hmm. and they'll just put it in a bag and freeze it and give it to us yeah. yes you said all these are supposed to be red lobster they all just from word of mouth heard about you and you call kind of thing or same thing or well uh, call, call, call them in uh jane uh and our staff has the relationship and when we did the tour yesterday she mentioned this relationship that we have with the organization who who coordinates all the donations for Pizza Hut and S Starbucks and R Red Lobster and Olive Garden and Chipotle and Auntie Anne's Bagels. And yeah. It's kind of a national clearinghouse for uh, organizations who want to donate but, and want to do it right but just don't know how to handle it. And so then they, we get in their network. Yes? So what does your voicemail say? If the idea is you never want to have somebody come to voicemail, but obviously the only reason you're not answering is because you're already on the phone. Yeah, I, my, my <laughs> message says... Um, I'm really sorry you've gotten this machine. All calls to this number are forwarded normally to my cell phone. Please try your call again, and uh, I'll respond quickly or leave a message, and I'll get back to you. And, and that has happened. I've been on, on my phone when people have called, and I'm uh, technically challenged, and a lot of times I hang up on people when I don't mean to, trying to get their call, you know, for, uh, forward it to their call. And so I have had actually had people who have left messages, uh, but it wasn't that I didn't try and get to them. You know, it's just that I didn't know how exactly, and ended up screwing it up somehow. But but basically, uh, I apologize that they've gotten the machine and say, please try your call again. 
and uh, this time I'll probably answer it or something like that, you know. Yes? It's hard to, to think of, of where it starts. I mean, we're not, where do we start from our seven our families with the Jewish infrastructure? You're starting with five or a dozen or so families. If you're doing that, is there, give me suggestions like avoid, don't, don't take uh, restaurant food right away, establish with some bread and canned goods and start small. Is some, something we could avoid I would just say never say no. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's, Susan and I can tell you stories about how we went and bought garbage cans from Fred Meyer, plastic garbage cans, so that we could go out to stag chili and fill them up with chili. And we didn't have a clean room or anything, but we found out it was available. And we, we went out to stag chili, a big manufacturing plant in Beaverton, and got bulk in garbage cans, a bulk stag chili. We didn't have refrigeration. We didn't have a clean room. But they offered it to us, and we didn't want to say no. And we would bag up that chili and try and get it into a refrigerator or a freezer somewhere, I guess, and and because uh, we had some lined up on our back patio. <laughs> and uh, and we just took whatever we could get, you know. And a lot, a lot of times, folks, it wasn't real easy, but but uh, it was profitable. Yesterday you got a copy of the white folder, a little QR folder. You can put them together uh, to hand to, to potential donors so they have good information about it right there. Um, it's, I think it's really professional looking and uh, it makes a big impression rather than calling up and saying, well, yeah, well, this is who we are, well, well. You can go and approach people Yeah, good website is very, very critical. Yes? Are you advertised your list of donors on your website? It's a powerful marketing tool as well as a great publicity tool for them because your reputation is so positive and stellar that your, you know, them being on your donor list and mentioning your website on any brochures or advertising, <coughs> is, you know, they want to be affiliated with you. Hmm. You're right. That should have been a bullet. Yeah, you're right. Uh, another thing that I would like to just pass on to you, we, I've gone out a few times and talked to people who maybe used to donate, and we've, we've tried to uh, rekindle relationships with some of our donors who have given in the past but then haven't for quite a while. And uh, so we ha actually hired a person, a part-time person, who we called a procurement uh, development position and uh, she and I would go out and call on people and, I, and we would play that NBC video for these folks and I'm telling you that was very very impressive and uh, Susan and I I'm sure would have no qualms for you to to go into a if it was a large donor and say you know here's here's who we are we're replicating this kind of a model and uh, and watch what this organization is doing and, and this is who we are we're we're gonna we're just like this. We're doing an accountability responsibility kind of program, and here's uh, the story on on Birch Community Services, and you know, would this make you feel better about donating? Or you know, I mean, this if if that'll help you at all, you're welcome to use that, and the link is right on the front page of our website. So you walk into an executive's office and say, could you pull up the website? And then all you've got to do is click and watch the NBC thing. So. Any other questions? 
All right, Andrew. Are you wired, or are you going to take this one? I think I'm. Can you hear me? Okay, great. All right. Thank you, Barry. I could be wrong, but I think you're the first person that got an applause. So, well, well done. <laughs> Um, and Barry, if you don't mind, there was a, just a couple things I wanted to add to that um, that really stuck out to me. Um, uh, on a very rare occasion, um, I take over the line, um, and I'll take all of those calls if, if Barry's out of the country or, or something uh, like that. Very, very rarely. Um, I can count on one hand how many times that's happened. Uh, during those experiences, um, Barry used to tell me 24-7, and you, know, you, you believe that but you really don't at the same time. I received uh, a couple different phone calls multiple times at like one in the morning, and it was a truck driver saying, you know, I had chicken, like, like Barry was saying. And you can be very honest. Uh, you don't have to tell that truck driver, yeah, I'm gonna jump out of bed and, and come get that chicken right there. But you can give them options. Um, if you wanna leave it at our, our doorstep, you know, that would be great. I can fax you a receipt. You know, this is wonderful of you. Thank you so much. You know, is there a way we can make this work? Um, another example is one time I was in the shower and somebody called and I quickly turned the shower off and I jumped out and I answered it and, and uh, um, it was Costco, a gentleman we worked with quite a bit from Costco and he said, are you in the restroom? I said, well, I'll be honest, I just got out of the shower. And he goes, man, you guys really do answer 24 seven. That is great. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be honest, you know, and, and, it, and it works out. Um, one more piece of advice. Um, we have come across donors, um, like Barry said, that have tried to take advantage of how open and willing we are to receive product. Um, one of them was giving us, um, I would call and I would talk to them and I'd say thank you so much and, and we would ask what it is they're gonna give to us. Uh, we're not asking details so I can say no over the phone or anything like that, but just so I'm kind of prepared. Um, and they said, oh yeah, we have a couple pallets of, of household chemicals. Well, when I got there, they had uh, over 15 pallets of industrial sized, you know, drums and bags. Uh, most of it wasn't marked and, and there was a lot of stuff like that. Obviously we can't take that, but I can approach them. And since I came willing to help them out, I can approach them and say, you know, we really honestly, we can't handle something like that, but I would love to take, you know, anything else off your hands. I know that'll help you somewhat. And also I have some more information you might, that might help you to be able to get rid of that. Um, we have an agency base that's fairly large. So a lot of the agencies can handle certain things that maybe we wouldn't be able to handle. But just having some kind of information to be able to give them so they're not just left with nothing is, is really is key. Um, they wanna know that you are trying to help them since they're trying to help you. Anyway, enough with that. <clears throat> So what do you do once you have somebody great like Barry answer the phone and you're pretty sure you're gonna get some product? You better be prepared. At our warehouse, as I took you around and I was describing the racking and the different systems we have in place and the different um, layout of the facility, we didn't have that drawn up overnight and plan out having that 22,000 square foot facility to, to handle all of that. Uh, just like many of you, um, Barry started out, Suzanne started out in their little house, and then their garage, and then they moved forward with that. One thing that I want to make sure that you guys are completely on board with and thinking about every single time before you get product, when you get product, is you need to make a plan. We were talking about earlier about being organized. Well, this is a big part in that. When you are going to receive product, you need to make sure that you have some kind of layout in your mind and uh, at your facility. So when they had their garage, they had a plan where the, the product was gonna be placed. Uh, they had uh, a rough idea of where they were gonna take that chili, where they were gonna break it down. They didn't know the moment they got that call how they were gonna do it, but they started immediately thinking about how they were gonna do it. They didn't let all the products start flowing in and then decide what to do with it. Immediately they were making a plan. 
I'm going to say that multiple times. You need to make a plan. Um, also, you need to try and have appropriate equipment. Uh, equipment that works, that's reliable, is key. Uh, when you're starting out small, that might be a forklift. That might be having a strong back. You know, That might be a lot of things, having help that can uh, help you get that product to your house and take care of it. If you don't think about those things ahead of time, you're going to have headache after headache, and it's going to be a real struggle. So you want to make a plan. You want to think ahead and be as organized as possible. Um, at our facility, once you start to get larger, you want to start thinking about installing safety tools. Um, throughout our entire warehouse, we have um, spill kits, and we have eye centers in case you get something in your eye. Um, we have guards on all of our racks. Um, a, a rack is a very expensive piece of equipment to replace. If you have a very simple guard in the front of it that's brightly colored that you know, helps uh, deter a, a forklift or something from crashing into it and wrecking it, you're going to save yourself uh, time, energy, and money. And just as a nonprofit, those are things you cannot waste. Um, we also have um, fire extinguishers. Um, we also have uh, signs all over the place uh, trying to help our uh, volunteers be aware that there are forklifts, there are you know, uh, obstacles that they might come about and, and trip on. We try really, really hard to avoid all of those problems before they happen. Um, be prepared. Make a plan. And, and I was just talking with Tara, and, uh, and she was explaining to me uh, they have a huge, huge book, and they have plans for everything, every possibility, every uh, problem that might come about before it actually happens, even if it never happens. They have a plan just in case. When you finally receive the product, what do you do? Make a plan. <laughs> At our facility, we have scales. When the product gets back in the trucks or, the, or volunteers bring it, the first thing that everybody does is they put it on carts and they weigh the product. It's essential. Uh, product needs to be weighed, not, not just because of, for tax reasons, but because it makes your organization creditable. When, they, when you are talking with a possible donor and you're able to say, like Barry can, last year you know, we had 6.3 million pounds of product. That sounds amazing. I mean, that is something tangible that they can envision in their head. And they say, wow, they, you know, they're getting that much product. I want to give to them. They must be doing something right. And also, like uh, um, Dave was saying earlier about grants, um, you're going to be using that, uh, those stats in your grant writing. Um, you want to have that at all times. Um, and and you know, that, like he said, that also goes for uh, volunteer time. But when our product shows up at the warehouse, immediately we put it on those scales, we get it written into our logbook, the one I showed you guys. <clears throat> and that way, it's always there for us to have. Um, later on, the office puts it into the database, and then it's always available. Um, uh, at the warehouse, as soon as the product gets there, they get it weighed, then they need to know where to put it. We have plans. We have processes that we follow. The product uh, goes to different staging areas. Um, in the warehouse number two, uh, over by where all the crates were stored, there's that very open, large area, and there was a bunch of teeny bread and a bunch of other things. When product comes in, the very first thing that we do after it's weighed is we put it in that staging area. And that, that, and that area gives us uh, uh, the ability to analyze the product. We can look at it. We can kind of see what it is, how much it, there is. Um, and then we can start to think, OK, well, what are we going to do with that? Uh, if you didn't have that space, if you just had racking everywhere, the moment you got it in, you have to choose what racking you're going to put it in. And then you're going to forget about it. You need to make a plan. Um, also, along with making a plan, after you put it in the staging area, when you put it into the racking, you have designated areas in the racking for product. Uh, we have an area for um, all of the banana boxes that you saw. Uh, they're stored there because we get them on a regular basis, and then they're sorted in that aisle. You don't want to put those banana boxes at the other end of the warehouse if you're going to have to be you know, grabbing those pallets every day and bringing them back to be sorted. So you want to think ahead. What is going to be the, the most efficient way to access those pallets every single time when we're using them? Um, just like I was talking about in Uncle Rico, uh, every, all the pallets that are on the floor, that's kind of like a staging area for our freezer. Everything that's on that floor 
either hasn't been sorted or is gonna be pulled out every single day. I don't put unsorted product up in the air because it's gonna get you know, forgot about and you're just, I mean, it literally gets stuck up there and be up there for a year and then go, oh wow, I didn't even realize I had that. And by then you might have freezer burn, you might have all sorts of different issues to deal with. So make a plan, make a plan, make a plan. Um, another thing that uh, we have at the warehouse is at the end of every aisle, just so that you have a tangible, visible reminder of what's up in the racking, we have simple whiteboards. And, and every single racking space has a number, and we just quickly write down whatever it is we're putting up there. Now, you're not going to get into details. Uh, you know, I have 23 cans of beans and 12 bags of rice or anything like that, but you might say unsorted product from COS or something. So that way you know immediately that racking spot is, has this item. When it gets pulled out, you just quickly erase it. You can look without having to go up and down those aisles and you can see exactly how much room you have um, and, and trust me, that'll save you so, so much time. So make a plan. And here's that, uh, the sheet uh, when you weigh the product. Um, I showed this uh, to you guys, and I think you guys have a copy in your books there. Uh, on the left, it's, it's really simple, and we want to make it simple. You don't want to confuse yourself with too much information. Uh, just, just what's vital. On the left, you're going to have uh, where it came from. Uh, for us, you know, we might write Mission Foods or um, Olive Garden or, or whatever it is. Uh, next to that, very clearly, and that's why we even write clearly, we want them to write their name. Uh, whoever it is. You know, I might pick it up, Barry might pick it up, a, a brand new participant might pick something up. We want to be able to look back in case there was any kind of question or issue or anything with that donation, we want to be able to ask that person. You know, it, it says here you had uh, milk and you wrote one pound. That doesn't quite add up. You can ask them, oh, I meant 100 pounds of milk, you know, something like that. So you want to make sure that they get their name in there and it's nice and clear. Next to it, you want to know the weight. And then after that, a brief description. And that'll just help in case they completely forget to uh, what it was, it gets lost, you need to know for our, uh, the donor or for yourself what it was. Much easier to, f to figure out what came. Yes? Could you just tell me what Jane does with that? So then Jane takes this in the office. I, at the end of every single day, we, after we put the date on it, take it into Jane, and then Jane puts it into the database. And that way we have quick access to all those stats. Um, once again, that's one of the wonderful reasons uh, why the database is so helpful. Uh, before, it was all handwritten, it added up all by hand, it was just, oh man, laborious, I can imagine. <laughs> Uh-huh, exactly. So that way you can look back uh, for another for tax reasons and also as a thank yous and everything else, you can look back and see exactly how much each donor is giving, when they gave it, uh, details about what they gave, uh, so on and so forth. Can you just print that off and give it to you and send it to Sam? I'm sorry? Can you print that off and give it to you and send it a uh, thank you letter and just we can, that we can just give that to them. Mm-hmm. Typically what happens is when I give it to Jane, I always look over it right before I give it to Jane, and if there's any blank spots, I try to address that. Uh, Jane will get it all the time if we get busy, and if there's a blank spot, she can then see who it was that brought it in, give them a call, and they can say, oh yeah, that's right, I brought in three boxes of bananas, and we can at least give an approximation of how much it weighed uh, if they forgot to weigh it or something like that. Um, and that doesn't happen all the time, but it does, it does happen, you know, people are people, they make mistakes. If we haven't sorted it, we can definitely pull it right out of the racking and give it away. Um, and that happens uh, with different product from Home Depot. Sometimes we'll, we'll get in and, and Home Depot, uh, when we receive product from them, many, many times it's not on a pallet um, and we'll get it all palletized and someone will completely forget to weigh a pallet. And then we'll go back and we'll go, oh, we completely forgot to weigh that. And then I can just pull that pallet up and get it weighed. Yeah. 
Yes. So just to get it straight, do you have, if you're picking up, mm -hmm. do you take your A log with you when you pick up so you can write down, okay, I went over to Home Depot and then I went over to, you know, whatever, and then come back and, and then weigh it and record it? So in other words, is there only a weigh and record right when you get to the warehouse or do the people who pick it up have a record with them? Does that make sense? It does make sense. We have receipts that we can give them. Um, and But other than that, uh, they'll call. So Barry will call me and say, I have, uh, you know, Fred Meyer has a pickup or I, whoever has a pickup. And he asks, you know, what it is. So we're prepared. So we take the right truck. 22 pallets from Pepsi the other day. So then my driver gets there. He picks up the first load. He comes back. We start weighing it as the other driver goes. And that's when everything that comes in immediately gets weighed um, and logged. Yeah. Yeah. Loving these questions. Absolutely. And I also know how technology sometimes messes up or just breaks things. Mm -hmm. and, and I can only I can only imagine that one with the scale that it's coming in. Yeah. And I assume you have to invest in that. If that thing comes to warehouse, you have to invest in that scale. And have you ever considered having a second scale for that with a backup just to handle product twice as quickly as it's I, I don't know how we how do. something like that is, but scale like that. We actually have um, a smaller scale. Um, and then we also have a uh, pallet size scale. And uh, my pallet size uh, scale, I have two different people that I can call. Um, I can't guarantee that they can come in, but they both know how to work on it. And I've had to in the past. Um, and they just happened to be shopping that day, so they came in and fixed the scale on the spot. Didn't cost me anything, but just having that record, and I'm actually gonna talk about that here very shortly. We'll dive into that, but yes, you want to always uh, be able to repair something like that. If it went down uh, to the point where we had to replace it, um, that's a whole other story. That uh, we would have to jump on that immediately. Um, it's uh, it's one of the things that has happened in a few times that you know we've been doing. I've been doing this a long time, and uh, I can look at a pallet and say, you know. <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me about that. <laughs> no, we have not yet. <laughs> not not because we have forgot to do it. We just ha I haven't received the information yet. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. That will get in the books. <laughs> don't need to worry about that. <laughs> yes. This might seem, this may seem like a minor question now, but it's probably crucial to you for mm -hmm. your backup filing and for the checks or whatever it is. When you pick up product or when product is delivered to you and you have the clipboard and you write all this stuff, do tax the receipt. The receipt. Mm -hmm. Do you give out that right to the trucker, or when you go to pick up, or do you, does the office mail it out? And do you keep a copy of it in that donor's file as a backup? Mm -hmm. There's or there's two different ways that they uh, can receive it. We always have on hand, no matter what. I even have in my personal car receipts. We always have receipts, and those receipts come with two copies. It's a carbon print and we keep one copy and they get another copy. Also, because we have the database, uh, we can send all that information to the donors if they want. 
Um, a lot of donors require different uh, information from us. Um, we will, uh, you know, make sure and do that uh, to the best of our ability and, and get them that information um, through fax or whatever the format they would like. Yeah, we, we take care of our donors, and if they have a, a process they want us to follow, we will do everything we can to make sure that happens. We keep all of our receipts uh, right next to the weight log. So when you go and you enter in all your weight, all that information, immediately following that, you put the receipt in that file, and it's filed for every single month. On top of that, the database itself has a server that's off-site, and it's online. Now, if that server were to fail, well, that's a whole other story, and unfortunately, that's out of our hands. Um, but we do have the paper receipts, uh, those copies, and we keep all of those. Yeah, no problem. Yes. How often are employees or individuals in a dairy and, and kind of picking up products versus kind of your going to a specific place? That's a really good question. We pick up products seven days a week. Um, we have two days during the month, or excuse me, during the week uh, that we do almost nothing but pick up product, and that's Tuesday and Thursday. On those days, we'll have one to two drivers available for the large trucks and they'll go out and pick up donations on a regular basis. We have, oh, what, 50 to 100 uh, participants that pick up donations um, as well, and that is something uh, Kim uh, oversees most of those small don donations, and a lot of them are through Harvest, um, and, she, and it, that requires a lot of special paperwork, and so she uh, maintains that, and that is uh, definitely a lot of work uh, that we ask of her. So, pat on your back there, Kim. Um, yeah, we have participants, uh, then we also have um, drivers. And the large trucks, we have very uh, special drivers because we can't just let anybody drive a 26-foot truck. And so we have a, a small list of drivers that are qualified to do that, that our insurance has okayed. Um, one of the people is not Barry because he's been in too many wrecks. So... <laughs> On our tour, Barry, uh, we uh, briefly were talking about the prodigal and the, uh, the fact that uh, you just recently were in that, that uh, fender bender. <laughs> he answers the phone 24-7. He was on the road and answered the phone and ran the truck right into the back of a <laughs> parked car. <laughs> I'm harassing you, Barry. I'll move on. <laughs> 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 yes, you will. <laughs> exactly. How long have you been working here, not counting tomorrow? Uh, hopefully, long enough. Um, <laughs> Everybody has to rest on Sunday, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm turning my phone off tomorrow. <laughs> All right, so. Once we have the product into uh, the facility, once we have it at the warehouse, uh, there's a number of things that we do to prepare it for our participants and for our agencies. Um, once again, like I've been saying, we make a plan. Um, all of our product is sorted. Uh, we don't let product come in and just assume it's in good quality and that it's safe and just put it on the floor. Um, if a pallet of obvious Pepsi all the way through the pallet comes in, we'll put that on the floor. But when we get a, pa a pallet that is just nothing but assorted goods, we're going to tear that all apart and make sure everything is safe for our participants. We don't want to jeopardize the health of our participants or their safety uh, in any manner. And the, the la quick story, um, recently a participant took home a bag of what they thought was rice, I believe so? Flour. And they got it home, and all over the bag it said, uh, not edible, do not use for food. Uh, silica, I believe, is what it was called. They proceeded to cook an entire batch of this silica and, and called Suzanne and said, wow, this, uh, what I thought was flour is tasting really strange. <laughs> Suzanne said, what, is, what does it say on the back? Well, it says, do not eat, and uh, it says silica. <laughs> 
we're not perfect. Sometimes something gets on the floor uh, that we overlooked, uh, but you know, the good thing is we have really good insurance and we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> no, we, we look out. This is very true. We have never had to use that. But uh, yeah, so we do everything that we can to prevent that from even being a possibility. Um, when we sort the produce, uh, as an example, uh, we try and pull out as much as we possibly can of anything that's not perfect, uh, something that might be moldy or something like that. Um, that sort out with all of the banana boxes I told you about, they go through every single box. They pull out anything that is uh, not safe. Um, they pull out and sort into appropriate locations um, each item. So that way we will be able to uh, uh, accumulate um, enough to appropriately give every family an opportunity to have something. We typically have between 600 and 700, uh, 700 participants. So we wanna make sure that during a one week period, we're gonna have 600 to 700 of that item. Uh, we know that that won't necessarily all 600 go out, but we wanna give everyone a fair opportunity. Um, we are huge about fairness, and Suzanne has mentioned that many, many times. Um, and that just kind of goes across the board. Yes? So do you just let items stockpile? Like, let's say you have 20 containers of cottage cheese and you're expecting 200 shoppers that week. Would mm -hmm. you just save it up and, and put it in the freezer to protect it so you can accumulate enough? Or how does that work? Well, the really good thing about refrigerated goods is we've thought about that. So let's say we get only 20 cases of that. Well, the good thing is that we have a deli shelf, and at that deli shelf, everyone is allowed to pick one item off the shelf. So we will accumulate 200 items of equal value or similar value, and we'll put it on those shelves. That also helps, like I was saying, if you have 600 uh, cans of beans and only you know, 480 of them go out, well, then you have all of those. You can add those to another item that is equal or very similar in value and then put that out, and it can be an either or, uh, or it can go with the deli. Um, our frozen goods, we have a five door freezer and, and in that uh, five door freezer, three doors uh, are for one item. So you get to look through those three different doors and if there's one item in there you want, great, get to pull it out. That gives everyone the opportunity to have something very similar. If we just put out you know, 50 items of sausage and 50 items of cottage cheese, most likely they're gonna pick the sausage and then somebody's gonna get stuck with cottage cheese every time. So we try everything we can uh, to make sure that we're completely fair. Um, a, a very common uh, misconception is that if you come earlier in the day, if you come right when we open, you're gonna get the first dibs, you're gonna have all the, the great stuff and all the scraps are gonna be left for everyone else. We split it up throughout the day. Uh, our produce goes out once an hour all day long. That way people are not just receiving the best produce in the morning and picking through it and leaving all of the scraps for everybody at the end of the day. We try very, very hard to make sure that we're as fair as possible. Um, and, and that is something I think that all of you can definitely uh, hone in on as well. Yes? We, we work on the honor system. Um, we keep an eye um, because it has happened. You'll see somebody and majority of the time, they just honestly didn't see the limit sign or accidentally grabbed two things or something like that. And we can very graciously say, oh, you know, did you realize that was only one item? I wanna make sure every family gets some. Oh yeah, absolutely, I apologize. Um, we don't uh, police everyone. I don't have time to do that, nor do we wanna be police you know, policing everybody. Um, as far as the weight, uh, once a year we do count the value. Um, we ask our participants every day when they bring home their stuff to write down um, estimated, and we also give them sheets of the value of each product. Um, we can't give the value of every single product, but we can definitely uh, be fairly accurate with an estimate. They add that all, all up for an, was it an entire month, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, my oh. Sorry, I will just, anyway, she will dive into that more. <laughs> that was a, it was a very good, very good question. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, going back to his, the freezer, sometimes you have people
people that others notice they're always kind of trying to get extra or something? Do you have pol is it in the policies that if people are consistently taking advantage, do you address that or you know what? I, I think Suzanne is gonna be covering this and, and I don't wanna <laughs> step on her toes. <laughs> I already have Barry against me, you know. <laughs> uh, real quick, we will uh, move on. I think I'm dragging this out a little too long. Um, make a plan, once again, uh, upkeep. Uh, all of the equipment, um, like I was saying with the large scale, you, we can't afford to have a huge fund to be able to replace and maintain all of our equipment every single time it breaks down. I have, and I, and I put in there, uh, some packets, I keep a list of all basic information of each piece of equipment, um, the tr whether it's the trucks or the forklifts. Um, and below that, I also keep a list of insurance that we have on those uh, pieces of equipment, uh, the trucks, for instance, and then uh, warranty information. And then next to that, I have uh, people I can call that are absolutely free participants, and that's always changing. Um, or I have people that have been have uh, been helping us out and will give us some kind of a cost break. They'll give us a deal and we have them come in and fix it. But anytime something breaks down, if I can't address it and Daryl can't address it, I immediately call one of the people that, are, uh, that for, we're gonna come out for free. And the, if they can make it great, last resort, I have the person that comes out that costs. Uh, you really have to try your best to be as frugal as possible, especially when you're just starting out. Um, we have the luxury of uh, grant writing and being able to get new compressors for a very, very long time. We just had to do with what we had.